Good day to you. Good day to you. Today our midday broadcast is a little late. Uh, today the word of the Lord and the vision of the Lord came in this manner. Then on that last night he said, uh, he broke the bread and said, uh, this is the, my broken body and I give it to you. Uh, so this is the strength of Christianity. This is the strength of the gospel that he, him doing that act of communion, breaking bread and uh, forecasting or foretelling that his body would be broken uh, and he, then he went to the cross and on the cross his body was broken, whiplashed, bruised, buffeted and a crown of thorns beaten with, with a pole and uh, he was bruised and Isaiah 53 says he was bruised for our iniquities and, uh, and then this broken body goes to the tomb and comes up in resurrection authority. Then he said in Matthew 28, all power in all authority in heaven and earth is given unto me. Matthew 28, 18, go ye therefore make disciples. So the broken body is the power of the gospel. Uh, so broken people touched by God's power uh, becomes witnesses and become the testimonies. So this is the power of Christianity. It, it, it's broken. Its Savior died. And the, uh, the Savior was broken, bleeding, bruised, unjustly treated. He comes back to life. And that life is our strength. That life is our power. So we have no apologies about the power of the gospel. But the power of the gospel is that it makes tough people, broken, soft, and they become new people. They live again differently. Uh, and then those who want to take the gospel with its power, they have to do so in the power of that gospel. And the change we expect is people become soft and gentle. And he said, take my yoke upon you. I am gentle, meek, and lowly. Learn of, learn of me, he said. Uh, so here in this vision we connect the brokenness and the power. Uh, so, uh, so we are going to look at this from Isaiah 53 verse 10. But the Lord has pleased to crush him, bruise him, put him to grief. He would render himself as a guilt offering. He will see his offspring. He will prolong his days and the good pleasure of the Lord will prosper, will be victorious in his hand. So this brokenness and victory. Uh, this is the part of the gospel. So the Roman Empire succumbed. They could not overcome the gospel because the gospel's power was in its brokenness. Uh, and no Christian must uh, try to take arrogate power to himself in voice or sound or any other way that's counterproductive to the true power of the gospel in a world that the gospel is challenged all the time. True power of the gospel comes from brokenness. And that power, uh, the gospel given in brokenness, is anointed by the Holy Spirit. There is the example of the Old Testament that the incense was broken small, beaten small, it became powdery, and it produced an aroma. And we know St. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 2.14, aroma of life to overcome uh, the death that's running in society. And for the anointing oil, the olive was bruised and the, the grape was bruised. Uh, so the myrrh, myrrh was obtained by bruising. The myrrh poured, the flower bruised uh, to obtain. So the story of the bruised, the victory of Christian faith. Uh, today also part of the gospel is that it rises when it is bruised and the fragrant fragrance, the aroma of life comes out of bruised experience. They the power of the gospel. And the making the oil, the anointing oil with bruised olives, oil is squeezed out. That's the power of the gospel. That's the power of the anointing. Available to everyone who would go through this modus operandi of being bruised. So Matthew 5 says, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for there is the kingdom of God. So on one side, we are needy, poor in spirit. On the other side, we we are given to extend the kingdom of God. Now we don't arrogate that power. It, the two go in balance. So we don't say we are poor, 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 poor. No. Uh, we are poor in the spirit. Needy and God feels the need to 
uh, extend the kingdom, to spread the kingdom of God, which is righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. Then meek shall rule the earth, so we learn meekness from Christ. Meekness is turning the other cheek, expecting God to come through when people uh, try to crush our head with insults, innuendos, false stories, slander. We put our head under the hand of God, and that is meekness. The other side of meekness is the meek people are given to rule the earth. So we don't say meek and get very scared and trembling. We are meek that we may rule with God. So this is the time God is going to match the two and take the nations. That's what's happening. Broken people, people who were once were, nobody gave them any chance. Such people will be raised up. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 1.18, not many highly placed. Paul was highly placed. But he said, not many. So Paul was the exception. He was a member of the Sanhedrin, ruling party, well-known, educated man from a very significant city. But Christ comes to him and his life turns around and they began to insult him, the very man whom they respected so much. And he, they, 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 he persecuted Christians, but when he met with Christ, he turned around. And the very man who was a great authority in Jerusalem, uh, they wanted to stone him to death, saying he's a heretic. That's the gospel. Uh, so um, uh, the, we are meek, but we know God has given us to rule. We are mourning, but we know the comfort of the gospel. So gospel's power is its intrinsic authenticity that in brokenness Christ was resurrected. That's, that's the pattern. That's the part of the cross. When we say the blood of Jesus Christ makes the makes peace, it's His blood that is shed. It was not a revolution that they shed other people's blood. It's the blood of Jesus Christ, the Savior, that was shed. So we have a character in the Old Testament, uh, in Judges 11, Jephthah. Now Jephthah, the Gileadite, was a valiant warrior, but he was the son of a harlot. And Gilead was the father of Jephthah. Gilead was a great man well-known and renowned, the whole area was named after him, uh, but he had a son from a harlot. He had his other sons from the proper wife, but son of a harlot. So you know what it is like all the time. They said it to him. So Jabez's mother thought it's a pain he was born. Uh, then David himself ate in the family, the son of another woman, and his brothers gave him no chance. Even his father didn't. But God chose him to be next king. So this is the gospel. This is how God works. Gilead's wife bore him sons, and when his wife's sons grew up, they drove Jephthah out and said to him, You shall not have an inheritance in our father's house. Get out, they said, for you are the son of another woman. It was a great insult. So Jephthah fled from his brothers and lived in the land of Tob, and worthless fellows gathered themselves about Jephthah, and they went out with him. So others driven out like him, insulted like him, uh, good for nothing, so to say, in the eyes of people, who went, came around him, but they became a mighty fighting force. You will remember in David's, you will remember in David's formative years, how similar, debt-ridden, distress, the people the king was trying to punish, they all came to David in a place called the Cave of Adullam. And they would turn them around into mighty warriors and great leaders later in Israel. So Jephthah fled. It came about after a while that the sons of Ammon fought against Israel. Some enemies came. Then the sons of Ammon fought against Israel. The elders of Gilead went to get Jephthah from the land of Tob. And they said to Jephthah, Come and be our chief, that we may fight against the sons of Ammon. The man who was not wanted is being wanted now. He is in demand. Then Jephthah said to the elders of Gilead, Did you not hate me and drive me from my father's house? So why have you come to me now when you are in trouble? So that's the way of an orphan. He grew up without father's care. And he made a name for himself with his bronze or with his brains. Now he says, <laughs> So you have come seeking after me. So such people need to take care that when elders come again looking for you, be humble. Because God, it is God who strengthens you. You understand? It's God who strengthens you. And they said to Jephthah, Come, be our chief. Uh, the elders of Gilead said to Jephthah, For this reason we have now returned, 
uh, that you may go with us and fight with the sons of uh, Ammon and become head over all the inhabitants of Gilead. So Jephthah said to elders, if you take me back to fight against the sons of Ammon and the Lord gives them up to me, I will become your head. So he's negotiating. That's how often are. they negotiate, they, are, they barter, they arbitrate, uh, they, 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 because the trump is in their hand, winning, winning game is in their hand. The elders of Gilead said, The Lord is witness between us. Surely we will do as you have said. Later you will find that uh, Jephthah's this nature of being rejected at the beginning comes up again and again because he was not really healed. So when, uh, when you are broken and God is mending you, lifting you up, we don't want to demand our portion that you have to watch. So we are learning today, broken but blessed and powerful. Hold the two together, not your power, it's God's power. So be the humble vessel, humble channel. So we are learning in Christianity meekness, rules. So don't be a rule. No, it's not us. It's Christ in us. The strength, the hope, the glory. God bless you.